Waiter, there's plastic in my soup. No doubt it's obvious to all of us that plastic pollution in oceans is a global challenge. But some plastic pollution is invisible. Microplastics. Recent research with fluorescent microplastic beads shows that these microplastics are even getting into tiny flying insects such as mosquitoes. Via that way, plastic enters the food chain and ultimately becomes a potential health problem for humans. Currently, the European Commission takes a closer look into the intentional uses of microplastic particles in products and the risk they pose to human health and the environment. Something I will discuss with Cristina da Avila, head of the Sustainable Chemicals Unit at DG Environment. Cristina, welcome. Thank you very much, Ter. Cristina, what is the definition of microplastics? This is an important question because there is not a scientifically agreed or standard definition of, uh, of microplastics which makes it very difficult for us to compare the data and the monitoring data that is uh, coming daily to our attention. So what I can tell you is the definition that the European Chemicals Agency is using in the restriction dossier. With the caveat, the definition may still be fine-tuned before the, the end of the process. And uh, what ECA is, uh, is using as a reference is that uh, microplastic is a polymer-containing particle, solid or semi-solid, with a size of five millimeters or less in any of the dimensions. So this is the, the definition that is being used. It's much broader, much wider than what uh, some countries are doing in national legislation. All plastics are polymers. Is that a reason to reconsider the current exception of all polymers from registration and evaluation under reach? Well, I think the most important thing to, to, to remember is that Polymers are not exempted from restrictions, and that's what we are doing now. We are using this uh, very flexible risk management tool that we have in, in REACH, which is restrictions, to address the risk associated with, uh, with uh, microplastics that are intentionally added in, uh, in products. Now, for the exemption on, uh, on registration and evaluation in REACH, it's an issue that has been present from the beginning in the original, uh, the first draft of the Commission proposal, Polymers were included, needed to be registered and, su and subject to evaluation, but they were taken out uh, after the, the public consultation. It's always been a, a, an issue that has been present in the mind of the Commission. We have for a long time been uh, looking into it, and only very recently we have launched yet another study to try to identify priority polymers so we can go into considering or reconsidering this, this exemption. Can you provide some examples from day-to-day -day life what microplastics are and where they are used? Well, we knew of some of the, of the uses of uh, intentionally added microplastics before we started this work. So the most well-known uses are in cosmetics, um, exfoliating uh, creams, toothpaste uh, or, um, or shower gels. But uh, it's very interesting that throughout the process of the work with, uh, with ECA, we are discovering uses that we didn't know were happening. The current focus of the Commission is to look into the intentionally added microplastics like in cosmetics, detergents, paints. Why? We are focusing on intentionally added microplastics and the reach because that's a possibility that we can do through the reach restrictions. But this is only one of the elements of the bigger and wider palette of options that the Commission is looking at in terms of, of microplastics under the plastic strategy. So we are also looking into, uh, into unintentional releases of microplastics. These are from very different uh, sources, so we need to, to cater for all of them. Um, they can be from wear and tear of tires, they can be from the washing of, uh, of clothes, they can also be the result of uh, losses during production or during use of the, of the plastics during transport. So we are going to look into, into them, we are currently looking into them, and see what kind of, of, uh, of proposals we can have to reduce this, these releases. One option is to introduce extended producer responsibility. We can also look at uh, standardized, uh, standardized uh, rules for the measuring and for the releases, try to minimize them. And finally, if need be, we can look into regulatory action. Earlier this year, ECA announced that they will start examining the need for an EU-wide restriction on the placing on the market or use uh, of certain microplastics. What is the current status of this process? In fact, it has been asked in the Commission that we have actually requested ECA to, to start preparing this restriction dossier under, under REACH. And ECA has uh, already done a lot of work. They've uh, done a call of, uh, of, for information 
in order to start uh, designing the, the restriction dossier. They have done uh, a stakeholder consultation as well, as through a workshop. And now they are putting all the information that they have gathered together and uh, finalize the, the restriction dossier. That uh, should be done by the end of this year, so at the beginning of, uh, of 2019, that's the deadline that we gave them. They should finalize it and send it through the procedure in, in ECA. This means that uh, the Risk Assessment uh, Committee and the Socioeconomic uh, Analysis Committee of ECA will look uh, into the dossier, into the proposal, start in the spring possibly, and finalize and send uh, their opinions to the Commission by the end of the year, so or by beginning of, of 2020. The restriction will probably um, consider whether an intentional use of a microplastic contributes to human health or environmental concern and to what extent. Furthermore, uh, it should be effective, practical, monitorable. Which risk-based screening criteria for identifying users are considered? We've chosen to go through restrictions under it, which is a very flexible risk management tool. So it allows us to go and address all the uses, taking into account uh, the risk associated with the uses, but also the socioeconomic considerations. The way we have approached it in this case is we will go for all possible uses. We start with a very wide scope of all possible uses. With this, we will be able to um, decide at the end uh, which are the uses that are going to be banned, those for which there are alternatives, those for which there is not costly to, 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 to substitute um, or do not provide. Uh, socioeconomic benefits. Then we will be able to have, for example, longer transitional periods for uses where the alternatives are yet not yet available, but we can see them coming, or when it might be a bit more costly for the time being to, to substitute. And finally, even consider derogations for uses where there are absolutely no alternatives, nor are they in the, in the, in the forecoming future, and uh, where the socioeconomic benefits uh, clearly uh, outweigh uh, the, the risk and the uses. From the beginning, we are not taking any risk-based consideration to, low, to, to um, narrow the scope of the restriction, but we will take all those considerations later on as we fine-tune the restriction and we go for all the details of the scope, possible derogations or possible longer transitional periods. Yeah, because it's about uh, the use, uh, if it's persistent in the environment, and it's about uh, the release during the use, basically. Exactly. Final question, do you see similar developments outside the EU? We have seen uh, some restrictions of, uh, of microplastics in other countries, such as Canada, New Zealand, also some states of the United States, uh, but no one has introduced uh, a restriction as wide as the one that we are introducing or we are working to introduce in the, in the European Union. What our expectation is, is that if we demonstrate that a restriction like this is feasible, Others will, uh, will follow through and will look at us and see how to, how to go about it. Christina, thank you for sharing with us some of the ingredients of the restriction recipe the EU has in mind. I hope it can turn the soup of the century into a digestible soup that fits everyone's diet.